Now, if you ask an emergency physician how they use lung ultrasound, a lot of them will say, I just use it for pneumothorax. Uh, this scares me a little because I think this is one of the hardest uses. Uh, the kindergarten stuff is uh, the acute severe dyspnea when you're looking for bee lines. A little bit harder perhaps is uh, the more complicated breathlessness cases where you employ your blue protocol. Uh, it's quite easy to look for localized pneumonias and other consolidations and we are really very good at effusion. Now in this talk we're going to follow the ED conventions because it's important to realize that uh, we have some geographical differences, some regional differences and certainly population difference. So it, it makes sense to follow the protocols that have been validated in your area. We'll stick to Volpicelli then, uh, who has four views bilaterally, the same view as yours, the midclavicular line longitudinally, anteriorly. Then we slide down the midclavicular line to the diaphragm and bounce back up to region two. Region 3 is behind the anterior axillary line, high in the axilla. And region 4 is as far post-row-basolaterally as we can go without sitting our patient forwards. So the first sign we look for is sliding. And if there is sliding, then you can say there is no pneumothorax at this point. Here, for example, is a 30-year-old man from an MVA with right-sided chest pain and dyspnea. Can you make the diagnosis from the chest x-ray? Now, if we put the ultrasound on, starting on the good side, uh, although it's hard because we move the probe a bit much, you can appreciate there's a little bit of extra movement of the pleural line and the tissue below the pleural line. In fact, if we put the M-mode cursor on, it shows that there are more ripples, wrinkles, uh, seashells on the shore beneath the pleural line than above. In mode's just a cheap way of saving the same thing. However, when we go to the right, it's not quite so straightforward. Uh, you can see that that white pleural line looks somewhat more dead. There's no twinkling or sparkling there or underneath. And the M mode shows what we call a barcode or stratosphere sign. When we see something like this, we then try and get a rough idea of quantification using our same four regions. In the apex, which is now no longer the highest point in our supine patient, we can see that there's pneumothorax. In the region 2, we knew that, it was pneumothorax. Region 3, interestingly, has B lines. B lines mean there must be lung tissue, so they exclude pneumothorax at this point. And at the base, we can see some very dense white lung. Uh, interestingly, there's no sign of any hemothorax behind that little arc of diaphragm on the screen right. So when we see this sort of thing, we can make a decision that, yes, there's a pneumothorax, but it's not huge. There's certainly contusion, which may be adding to the dyspnea, and there's no hemothorax at present. So in our context, we'd say it's okay to wait for a CT. Yeah looking for this area here where lung tissue hits free air. You'll notice there's no actual break in the white line, there's just an area of sliding and non-sliding. This is a lung point and it's 100% specific. So this is the patient we scanned. We certainly were able to see this limited pneumothorax, but we didn't really have any idea of the depth. For an ultrasound probe, two millimeters of air looks the same as two centimeters of air. We did, however, pick that contusion and also the fact there was no hemothorax. Some of the pitfalls are subcutaneous emphysema. This looks for all the world like um, free air. Uh, it doesn't move, but it is shallow to the ribs and it's a nuisance because it stops you looking deeper down. Of course, it implies that you do have a pneumothorax somewhere. Bulla are another big problem. Even using a straight probe, it can be very hard to tell whether there's independent sliding or whether it's just part of the normal respiratory motion of the chest wall. Sometimes you're left just looking at those tiny little pleural line irregularities called Z lines to decide that there's actually lung here. Pleurodesis can be even harder. 
I still to this day don't know whether that's free air or tethered lung, even after looking at the CT scan. Now B lines, this is the easy stuff, this is the kindergarten stuff. They're a sign of increased density at that point, if you have more than two at once. It used to be called edema, but that's um, a bit much of an assumption. Here is a 60-year-old who's pale, sweaty, with a wheezy chest and tachycardic. That's the chest x-ray, and the formal chest x-ray report was a bit non-committal. They admitted that there were curly B lines, but couldn't see any other particular signs of fluid overload. When we're worried and in a rush in the emergency, sometimes we cut down to just two hot spots. These are the halfway between region 1 and region 3. And if you can see lots of bee lines there and lots of bee lines on the other side, you can say that there's no large pneumothorax either side, but also it's most likely to be CCF. And when we see this wheels aside, we'll decrease the preload. We won't give any more fluids just at the moment and perhaps go towards CPAP. Now, how to tell an experienced operator? Experienced operator can usually get the pleural line horizontally across the screen, meaning they've got good uh, hand control. And they want that pleural line to be very thin, means they've got the right angle with the pleura. Conversely, if you see something like this where the pleural line is indistinct and slides down to the side, it means that whoever was doing this doesn't appreciate the curve of the chest wall under the pectoralis major. And the fact that you actually have to point the probe a little towards the mediastinum in the top region. On the posterior chest, you actually have to um, point it the other way when you're paraspinal. In ED, we have a, a broader disease uh, range or spectrum. Uh, here's a 75-year-old with exertional dyspnea for three days. Do you think this is pulmonary edema? What could it be? If I pull out uh, Volpicelli's 8-view protocol and get a picture like this, uh, B lines in all regions, I would say his chance of having acute pulmonary edema is pretty high. Uh, for a while we were trying to count the B lines, saying that if you had more than three in more than two regions on both sides of the chest, that that would um, be CCF. Since this time we've realised that different probes give slightly different looks to the B lines, different spread, and so we cut back a little and we would now say that we'd be happy with a bilateral multi-zonal symmetrical contiguous change. And if you see that sort of thing, our decision becomes diuretics, not nebulizers. With this sort of a protocol, Martindale's uh, meta-analysis said that we had a sensitivity of 85%, specificity of 92%. Uh, the big confounder is inflammatory lung conditions, and we admit this, we know this. The other confounder is gold standards because in, in these studies we do in the ED, we cannot justify getting a, an echo on everybody in the ED, or we can't afford it rather, and we can't justify getting a CT on everybody. The big pitfall is fibrosing lung conditions or inflammatory lung conditions because they look very similar. On the left we have typical B lines in heart failure with the thin pleura. On the right we have B lines with a thick and knobbly pleura. Lichtenstein used to call it a C pattern because the irregularities were less than a centimetre in size. Now an expert to try and tell the difference between the two will look at the IVC. We'll also add a heart view and if you're really desperate we'll put on some deep veins. And when we add this sort of multi-system review we can get our diagnostic sensitivities up to 97%. Bearing in mind though, although this was a large multi-centre study, it was with expert practitioners. The third pattern is the C pattern, or if you want to be politically correct, pleural line abnormalities with subpleural consolidations. And they indicate abnormal lung tissue, either acute or chronic, um, and we can't tell which. Here is a 70-year-old man with severe dyspnea. 
too unwell to give a history, full fill crackles, oxygen sats of 82%. Do we go down the GTN BiPAP path or is this going to be a, a pneumonitis or something? Uh, obviously at 2am in the morning you're very inclined to call it CCF. So if we look at the apices right and left, you can see bilateral B lines and you start to think, oh yeah, I was right. Uh, looking in the mid zones, we have a continuation of the B lines. Uh, I'll start to put in some clips now. I know if I put too many clips in, uh, PowerPoint doesn't like it. But when you see the clips, it starts to become concerning that the plural line isn't straight. It's got these little tiny divots and pock marks in it. What's more, it is... Um, symmetrical and bilateral. I've only got one view of the base so that I could show it to you enlarged. It's quite irregular. Um, it's not usually this distinct. When we see this pattern you really become worried about fibrosis rather than heart failure and you hold off on the GTN and the BiPAP and start digging around on the past imaging and the history. An expert operator will go immediately to the heart to get some impression of, in this case, a reasonably respectable left ventricular ejection fraction and at the same time a large right heart that suggests that this condition has been a load on the right heart for quite a while now. When you do get the chest x-ray, you see, I knew that, but uh, in my small hospital a chest x-ray for the ED isn't the highest priority. One of the pitfalls is when you try and use the IVC to differentiate between fibrosis and heart failure. The reason being it can be large IVC in both right or left heart failure and it can be a small IVC in both. The value of using the IVC is for management, not for diagnosis. Consolidation is easy, uh, it just takes a bit more time. And because we're looking for a local change, we have to use a different search strategy. We don't want to miss any areas of chest wall. Typical case would be a 10 year old with cough and fever for more than a week. Not terribly unwell, but not getting better and the parents are worried. The observations are normal and of course the parents would like a chest x-ray. Now in children, because they're smaller and wrigglier, um, you have a different approach. A good method is to run a line of jelly down the middle of the front, down the side and down the back. Make sure you have a good grip because they get very slippery. And you slide your probe down in a single sweep. If they're under four years old, you can use a straight probe. And all you're doing is looking at the plural line. See, plura, 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 liver, plura, 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 liver. And it's smooth and straight. We run down the axilla and again we're just focusing on the pleural line looking for any warning signs. Pleura, 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 liver. Posteriorly, I've got the probe in trans this time because it gives you a wider spread. Again, it's a pristine pleura. It's sharp and clean with no B lines. There's the liver. Now in this particular case, there was actually one area of B lines anteriorly low on the chest, region 2. This is a sign to dig deeper here. The lateral sweep, just so as you can see, was pretty normal. This is going up from the bottom, not sure why I was doing that. And posteriorly, uh, again, clean pristine pleura. Children generally have clean skins. Now going back to that area that was worrying, uh, lower anterior means we need to check out the right middle lobe and we can do that using the divergent beams of the curved probe looking through the diaphragm and here you can see behind the diaphragm there's quite a large solid area occasionally obscured by the uh, upper lobe of the lung coming in front whenever you see something that's worrying like this you should always go into another dimension so we can show it in two different angles you can see it's actually quite a deep area of consolidation here with some air bronchograms in the lower field. Because not everyone is uh, thoroughly believing in, chest, in the lung ultrasound yet, we did get a chest x-ray and this is the chest x-ray of that child. 
One of the problems, at least with children, is that we will miss about 8% of pneumonias because about 8% don't touch the lung surface. Perhaps they'll cause a few bee lines because most inflammatory conditions affect the pleural lymphatics to a degree, but you can underestimate your condition. The problem in adults is that the consolidation is not necessarily pneumonia, but it could be a malignancy or even a pulmonary infarct. It would take something like elastography or uh, contrast injection, ultrasound contrast, to tell any further. Now, we are very good at effusions. Take, for example, this 63-year-old who came in obviously critically unwell. Previously healthy patient with fevers and cough for five days. Hypoxic, tachycardic, but normotensive, meaning that she was able to get a CT scan, which was reported as a loculated effusion, recommend an ultrasound guided aspiration. Our sonographer was very busy and said that they would mark the skin at the end of the day. We asked the medreg to take the patient, but the medreg quite rightly said, well, hang on, if this is um, an empyema, we need to transfer the patient to a cardiothoracic unit, so could you get a surgical review? And because we don't do cardiothoracics at our hospital, the surgeons were understandably unwilling to give an opinion. So... This is our question. Do we just put in a normal intercostal catheter and drain it, or should we be hitting a cardiothoracic team for an interhospital transfer? Well, we scanned. Region 1 looked clear. Region 2, already we're starting to get some consolidation on the screen right. Region 3 was very worrying with quite an unusual conformation of fluid, unusual pattern of lung collapse and the diaphragm on the right's risen up a bit and as I said a very high diaphragm with what you can see is air at the back not fluid at the base of the screen suggesting that the fluid we are seeing is not obeying the normal transudate gravity rule. Here is um, about two centimeters at least of fluid if you look carefully, you can see some fibrin waving freely in it, suggesting that it's relatively thin fluid. Um, if you want to check how thick and viscid a fluid is, one thing you can do is put an M mode through it. This is one of Lichtenstein's recommendations. And if the lung is expanding underneath, it suggests that the fluid's not tight. Lichtenstein refers to it as a sinusoidal sign, the description of the way the lung waves within the pleura, within the effusion, uh, like this, when it's thin fluid. Now, we do have some um, uh, limitations with effusions. No one's got a really good um, estimate of volume yet because none of our um, formulas can quite take into account the geometry of the underlying lung. So there's a fair error. In emergency, we just say if it's deeper than a centimetre, we can probably tap it. A second pitfall is this condition. Uh, as you can see, it's dark and it looks like fluid, but you also notice it's in the apex. It's causing the chest wall to bulge outwards. And when we watch how it moves, we can see that the lung tissue underneath it doesn't actually slide much. It looks pretty rigid. If we put an M mode through that, there's hardly any movement at all. That is the mesothelioma. Don't put a needle in it. So in summary, we have five signs. They're the same signs you guys have got. We just give them slightly different meanings in different cases. We look for sliding most definitely. We look for B lines, and they are usually pulmonary edema, but not always. We look for the C pattern. When we see this, our heart sinks because we know it's going to be a complicated case. Uh, consolidation is easy to find, but you've got to search posteriorly as well, and you'll only see it if it touches the surface. Finally, effusions. Ah, we're good at them. We can look at them closely and learn many things. So in summary, in the emergency department, we can use lung ultrasound for timely decision support anywhere, anytime, even the ramping area. If you're looking at our pictures, 
see that we've got the plural sharp and we've got names and labels on the pictures. That'll give you an idea of how long we've been doing this. And finally, what we're doing is screening only. This should not be our definitive diagnosis. Thank you.